Good evening, viewers and listeners of Globespan here in Guyana, uh, in the diaspora and all across the world. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to another edition of our program. This evening, I have with us a very special guest, a senior government functionary, Dr. Peter Amsaru, who is the chief investment officer of Guyana and the chief executive officer of the Guyana Office for Investment. Uh, Dr. Ramsroop, of course, has a wealth of experience in business. He has an array of skills in the field of social sciences, including economics, finance, management, etc. Um, and he is certainly holding this portfolio at a very important time. My name is Richard Rambran, and I will be your host, uh, moderator, and uh, in this evening, of course, it being myself and Dr. Ramsroop, we'll take perhaps a little bit of a different approach and tone to our program, and it will be more conversational in nature, very free-flowing, um, and so the ideas and the uh, thoughts and advances can come out adequately. Dr. Ramsroop, thank you for joining us, and it's certainly a pleasure and a privilege to be here this evening with you. Same here, Richard. I appreciate uh, your time, and I know with your um, participation and activity in the private sector, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. So, Peter, um, of course, we are still within the very first year of the uh, Air Finale government um, and its administration. And this naturally, as I have been saying for quite some time hosting this show, comes off of the heels of quite a turbulent time uh, in the macro scenario for Guyana and in the country's overall history. And so you are sitting at the helm, you have quite a task ahead of you uh, to rebuild confidence in the economy, to foster investors into Guyana, and to essentially send the right and credible signals, um, being the country's chief investment officer, to both foreign as well as domestic uh, investors. And of course, I know a lot of people don't know that role of GoInvest, that it plays that dual function for both foreign investors as well as local investors. Um, of course, being at the helm of this organization, and perhaps before we, we delve into the topic at hand this evening, which is Guyana's economic development um, and investment, I perhaps want for you to give the average viewer who may not know uh, about GoInvest, what GoInvest is, and for those who may know, refresh them uh, on what GoInvest is and how uh, this agency functions within the architecture of Guyana. Thanks, Richard. Well, Guyana Office for Investment is responsible for both local and foreign investors um, looking to participate in Ghana's economy. We are um, established on the uh, Public Corporation Act. Um, our office is part of the office of the President of Guyana. And our goal really is to facilitate and instigate and, and manage uh, investment in areas where Guyana believes is needed in order to grow our economy across all sectors. So our staff is trained in terms of, of understanding a company, for example, a foreign company coming into Guyana, uh, they have to understand our laws, they have to be able to establish a, a, a local entity, they can partner with, with uh, local companies, they've got to have the financial backing uh, source of funding, and you know we put all of that together in a, in a formal business plan. We are considered the business arm of the government, basically to facilitate uh, the investment opportunities. Our, our our office is open. We are uh, customer service based. We believe Guyana is on a trajectory of growth. We know any nation in the world develops uh, with both local content uh, investments and. FDI foreign direct investments and and we look forward to working with all of the areas and all sectors and companies that are looking forward to do business in our country. Thank you, Peter, for that response. Um, now, of course, for those who have been following the national discourse and the, and the, the uh, government affairs, 
one would know that very frontally, uh, the government has advanced that they are pro-private sector. Um, it, it has come out in a number of budget speeches that uh, they are, their intent is to drive the private sector forward. And naturally, Peter, as you have, uh, have adumbrated in that introduction, um, that your agency plays a critical role in private sector development. Now, of course, over the next uh, few years, until during this, this term of, of Dr. Ali's government, um, there are going to be a variety of private sector development projects being undertaken or those which are looking to be undertaken by, by the government. Uh, Peter, you want to perhaps just shed some light on what are some of those main areas, some of those big topics uh, that the government is, is looking at um, to ensure that private sector uh, involvement exists. Well, I want to first start off, Richard, with, with the understanding of a nation growing and our economy growing under President Ali's administration. One of the key components and one of the foundation of economic growth is our strong belief in democracy. And over the last year, you would have witnessed our fight for democracy, our engagement in ensuring that not just democracy, democracy that is threatened, but ensure that democracy is never taken away from Guyana. So the foundation of private sector growth and, and economic development in any country depends on the democratic principles and our government strongly believe and will defend and protect democracy at all costs. So I want to just reiterate that as we start the discussion of what it takes to grow our economy from a, from a from an economic and business perspective. Our president has outlined an aggressive economic agenda for our nation. You know, with any company, and the private sector knows this very well, you know, you start off with your theory, your your vision and your your action plan and your objectives and goals. Our president has started off with his vision. His vision is absolutely of one Guyana. He wants and is the president of all Guyana. So in his development plan, his goal is the creation of wealth for Guyanese. Ultimately, anything we do and anything under the president plan that is measurable, that is actionable, is about the creation of wealth, is the creation of jobs. He talks about 50,000 new jobs in the next five years. And how do we build that? I want to get into that discussion with you today. But, you know, is budget 2021, and I know you will go through that a little more in detail, describes that foundational um, component that when the private sector looks at what government involvement is in developing the economy, I tell folks, we are the partner. We are the investor. Government is there to ensure the infrastructure is, the, is there. The tax incentives and the tax initiatives and the tax laws is friendly enough for the private sector to do well. So with all of that, I believe it requires bold and courageous leadership. And what we have in our government, what we have in our president, I call him my president, I call him our president. He has defined the foundation, he has defined and, and describe how he will manage Guyana. And what you've seen in the, in the few months that we've been in office is an exciting new environment where the private sector understands that we are there to enable them to do well. We are not anti-business. We believe businesses should have a profit. They should make a profit. We believe in the creation of jobs. People should have jobs that, with better paying salaries. So we hope, as, and, and as we go forward in the next five years, that the business community and the business environment, both local and foreign, realize with the foundation of democracy, with bold leadership and courage of our president, with a defined economic plan and a budget to support it, we are there to make the private sector flourish and ultimately all of Guyana benefit. Right. Thank, thanks for that, Peter. Now, Peter, certainly you this you have um, quite a number of discussions with with foreign investors. And as we're on the topic of of signals and and pro private sector development and democracy being a, an underlying uh, a, a pivotal point 
in driving economic growth. I want to ask this question uh, to you because I, I'm not sure if the average uh, Guyanese or, or the citizenry who may not be in communication with uh, investors understand. But my question is, how much did the events um, of those six months mar or tarnish the image um, of the country? And what, what kind of questions have you been receiving regarding the public uh, the public administration and the entire governance of the of the country. Well, I really believe, Richard, the positive outcome of what um, the previous government and the PNC has done to Guyana, um, currently the opposition party, did tarnish our country. But the positive out of that that the world understands and the world now knows that Guyana and the people of Guyana will stand to the maximum in defense of our democracy. And any investor coming into our country, I will tell you, David says, because of that fight for democracy, because democracy won, they are interested. In, they know their investments will be protected because they know we will never, and the international community will never allow Guyana to go into a dictatorship. We are now never would allow Guyana to be threatened by the uh, anti-democratic forces, and we would never allow democracy to be taken away from us. And that again is the foundation of what investors believe as they come into our country that they are safe. They know that our laws will protect them. They know that we are there to ensure that contracts the government sign is protected. We know that 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 our tax uh, implications and our tax laws will be beneficial to all of Guyanese, uh, both uh, in Guyana and companies coming in again and the diaspora. I want to welcome the diaspora looking at this program. We are very much looking forward to your involvement in our growth and I want to expand on that later on. But but Richard, I, I believe that um, the the defense of our democracy is an, ex is an attracting environment for investors coming into Guyana. And we will continue to ensure that our democratic principles, our democratic belief is always there. And those that stifle democracy are stifling economic growth. And our population has seen it. They have, they have rejected it. The opposition needs to understand and wake up that it will never be allowed. They need to move on, get on with the business of our nation. And I tell them, do not tell your supporters about anything else but democracy because all you would do is hurt your supporters, all of us, and our president has outlined the vision that he is the president for all Guyana. His budget, 2021 budget, Richard, defines an economic plan for every single region, every single race, every single culture, every religion. It's, it's one of the best budgets I have evaluated and I've seen over the decades. And, and Dr. Ali has, set up a measurable plan. It's not just a fluff. It's not just a, a writing. It is a measurable plan when implemented. All of us can say, I've seen where it is. I've seen where it is today. And guess what? I want to be part of, of Guyana's growth. And as I said in my job, Richard, I want to sidetrack a little bit. You know, as I talk about the future of Guyana and I talk about, you know, where Guyana is skating to, where the puck is going to be. I grew up in Guyana. I remember my parents telling me, Guyana has so much potential, so much potential. Why can't we get it? Well, we have now the enabling factors to be able to do that. We no longer have potential. We have opportunities. And the president has a vision. There's a term in the business world that says, catch the vision. Guyanese in Guyana and investors around the world have catch the vision. They are coming to our shores. They're being part of that development. And they are want to make us grow with them and we want them to grow with us and and the bold leadership and the courageous leadership of our president that cuts across again all categories in our country is one of the most exciting things we will be part of in this next decade and i look forward to working with with the investors with the economic and the private sector in facilitating those opportunities yeah Thanks so much for that, Peter. I think um, I, I have a colleague of mine. He described the recent events as being the ultimate stress test on democracy. 
And for us to come out on the right end of it, it means that we can stress our, our structures it seems, to the maximum. And that he has described to me is perhaps the be one of the best ways um, of describing what has actually happened. And when you stress that democracy to the maximum, it did not break. And so investors can certainly be guaranteed that when they invest in Guyana, whether foreign or whether domestic, that that investment is firm, that that's one that is going to uh, be a return and you don't have to worry about uh, expropriation or, or government seizures and, and, and nationalization um, in the way that countries that have fallen into dictatorship, etc., um, such as our neighbors and so on, have to have to worry about. Um, and so I think that those send very credible signals. Um, and I, and, and I want to say that even though the events um, were, were very disconcerting, from my position where I sit in the private sector, I can say that there, ha there is renewed confidence in the economy, um, and certainly we see that being rebounded. You know, a very interesting point, Peter, um, that Budget 2021 brought out was the growth rate that happened in Budget 2020, in, or during the fiscal year 2020, rather. Um, and we see that much ado has been made about 40 odd percent growth rate and that of course being attributed to the oil sector but what um and i heard some some opposition parliamentarians even saying that 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 is that is for based on the economic management and so on of of the former finance minister during that year and what was not highlighted however was what the non-oil growth rate was and that was a massive contraction of 7.2%. Um, and this, of course, is something which, which I believe, uh, Peter, will begin to change as we are beginning to see credible signals being sent in the right direction. Um, and certainly private sector development uh, being, being fostered and tangible steps being taken. I, I, I was asked recently um, about how do I, how, how do I view um, the interest in our country um, and is it tangible? And my response to it was that it is not just only that investors are talking the talk, but they are also walking the walk. And so many of the investors, they're not just coming to the shores and participating in business rhythm and scoping out opportunities, but Peter, you you know very well, um, as I do, and for the viewers and listeners, that many investors are coming to the shores and they're incorporating companies. They're coming to the shores and they're looking for local partners. Joint ventureships are materializing to make bids in and around the oil and gas industry. Um, and that, of course, plays a very important role in ensuring that tangible development happens and that the development that occurs is not only concentrated within one specific sector or one uh, specific subgroup or demographic in the country, but rather opportunities can be spread for all. Now, Peter, over the next five years, the government will be embarking on a particular uh, program. And that program, as you have highlighted or alluded to, 50,000 house lots, um, a large number of jobs being created, etc. But how do you view budget 2021, Peter, as being contributing uh, to that broad vision? I know we talk about it being a step in the right direction, um, but from your perspective and from private sector development, what do you see in the budget that really uh, lights up the eyes of investors or the eyes of the private sector um, for growth over the next five years? Well, what our president has done with this budget, and as you study the budget and you look across the implications it has for every citizen in our country, and I will stick with that for a second before coming in from the outside world, he has created a sense of duty, a duty of hope, and a national pride back in our country. The environment in the last six months has changed drastically over the five and five years and five months that the or five years that the, the previous government was in place. You know, in the five years that, that the last government, there has been zero investment. 
There has been zero new housing environment in our country. The stagnation, as you said, the contraction of our economy was significant. Thousands of Guyanese were, were laid off because of poor policies, closing of the sugar estate. And, you know, when people, when I say that, I always tell people, you know, when they say sugar, people think sugar was what the reason why the previous government shut down the sugar industry. But what they didn't realize is that the sugar cane is one of the most valuable products around the world. The byproducts of the sugar cane creates a lot of opportunities. But with the president's vision and the national pride and sense of duty that he has put back into place, is he has renewed our dream. And by renewing that dream, that as a Guyanese, we can be part of that development by putting innovation in technology and modernizing our known in, in, uh, infrastructure, known industries, creating that culture of excellence. That's where you're going to find, and Budget 2021 describes the infrastructure development. And anytime you have an infrastructure development in a country, an investor wants to know, I want to develop in agriculture. But if I know that the government will invest in the, the farmland roads, then I will be able to get my equipment into the farmlands. I will be able to produce at a better cost. If I can have an integrated energy plan, which our president has proposed in our 2021 budget, where our goal is to reduce energy costs by 60%, we are going to start the, the gas to shore pipeline. We're going to expand on wind power and solar power and, and, and the hydro. That's an integrated energy plan. When a, a, a business or a person, a citizen, know that our government has embarked on an aggressive financial um, program to ensure an integrated solution of energy happens, we've got to be ready. Because if you're not building your manufacturing plant right now, as energy costs come down, you'll be out of business. You, you wouldn't even be in the game. So the, the components of the budget describes what makes the country in the next three years develop. And that's where, you know, from, from I talk about renewing the dream, is transforming our agriculture sector from, you know, basic agriculture to, to plantation agriculture, to agro-processing, you know, looking at developing a new modern city, the oil and gas industry, the tourism industry, and we'll get into some of those details with numbers, you know, when we look at the connection between Brazil and Guyana and Suriname, creating that new corridor for trade, building the deep water harbor that would allow the large transshipment, bringing transport economics down. We're looking at bridging the quarantine river um, between Suriname and Guyana, new infrastructure highways within the country that open up new land. You can get a better partner from the private sector than what government has proposed in the 2021 budget. And it's real. It's already being implemented. It was starting in the 2020 budget. We saw the 43% plus growth in our economy. We have seen the projection for 2021. It is. We've got to get on with running the business of our country. And we, all of us, whether you're a citizen, whether you're a business, private sector, whether you're a foreign investor, it is time we all put that forces together look at the, the infrastructure and development plan of our 2021 budget, join forces and help us build Guyana to that dream that our president has outlined in his vision of a one Guyana and how we will produce what Guyana can do. We will become a net exporter of energy in the near future. Who would have ever thought Guyana, always struggle with energy problems, will now become a net exporter of energy? It tells you about bold leadership, courageous leadership, someone that is that has understand what Guyana was, what it is today, and what it will be tomorrow. Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, said, you skate to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is today. And all of us are excited that we know, whether you're in the diaspora, whether you're in Guyana, whether you're private or local, we get to join, we get to develop Guyana the way we always think it would be. Richard, that is the most exciting part of our job here, to see the, the willingness of investors coming in to go, guys, I want to be in. Tell me about the local company. You are part of our business community and, and been active in, in, our, 
in our private sector, you see the joint ventures approach, the consortiums that are being developed. We don't want anyone to be left behind. And, and opposition and those that are against democracy, economics, courage, courageous leadership, bold leadership will change all of that and it's already making a difference in our country. Yeah, Peter, I find the point which you make, particularly regarding infrastructure and infrastructure development to be um, very poignant. Uh, for those who have not been able to take a close look at Budget 2021, um, mm -hmm. as that was as part of what we're discussing here, it, the government has programmed almost 45% of that of the budget on three particular sectors, uh -huh. education, public infrastructure, and health care. Um, and out of that, almost $60 billion, or about 15% of the entire budget, is based around the sector of public infrastructure and the entire construct or um, the entire construction rather of the country and building out the infrastructure of the, con of the country. And when one examines the measures in budget 2021 regarding the reduction of VAT, the removal of uh, the re removal of VAT, the removal of, uh, of uh, a number of items or the reversal of, of VAT which was placed on from, from um, from being exempted back to being zero rated. Uh, so those, those are actions or those measures which essentially would spur the construction sector. And for me, uh, I view that as being one year to kickstart the economy. Construction is one of those sectors that are, that, that it's a unique sector where when construction begins, it has the ability to catalyze and to spur growth because it really is the building out of the country. Um, for those who are perhaps versed in some bit of economics, they would know that during the Great Depression or any um, economic recession, uh, which we have, of course, been going through here over the past uh, few months, part of the way that you really do kickstart the economy is through construction. And I think Dr. Ali uh, and his government understanding um, the macro fundamentals, and how to drive economic growth, have done a good job in ensuring that construction sector is being spurred on. Um, Budget 2021 for me represents that foundation upon which uh, that economic growth can happen. Peter, I just want to pivot the conversation just a little bit um, because you mentioned a very key sector, um, and that of course is the energy sector. Now, we know that Guyana over the years has been struggling with the energy sectors. You have you've rightfully alluded to. We have struggled over the years with not only the cost of electricity, uh, but the reliability of the electricity. And then for those who are in woodworking and printing, they know also that the quality of electricity that we have here is not as good electricity as we want. Now, we talk in modern uh, development thought about something called a sustainable energy mix. Whereas prior to the engagement um, of the United Nations regarding its sustainable development goals, you would have just had generators being brought in, fossil fuels being burned. But of course, the world has changed, particularly since the 1970s and 80s and taken a more environmentally conscious role. And now um, countries have to take a more environmentally conscious role in their development. And now we talk about something called the sustainable energy mix. And when we speak about this, it means combining a variety of uh, energy sources, including fossil fuels, but towards solar, towards uh, ensuring that we have wind power being harnessed, hydropower. Peter, I know that um, the... the Go Invest plays a very important role in, in ushering in uh, investors and, and you perhaps have been receiving a number of inquiries and tremendous interest in the energy sector. You want to just speak a little bit to the energy mix um, and how the government sees this sustainable energy mix and what are some of the most, uh, what, what are some of the high priority sectors in terms of investment in, in the energy sector? Well, you know, the development of a world-class energy mix, I mean, what we are looking uh, over the next uh, few years is, is the installation 
of 400 megawatts of new installed capacity. You know, that is inclusive of hydro, it's inclusive of, of, of solar, wind, and natural gas. You know, the low carbon development strategy is moving towards expanding the, the LCDS as we know it. The budget 2021 20, talks about $28.4 billion, I believe, will be invested in primarily renewable energy pro uh, projects. You know, 700 million of that budget, um, if my numbers are correct, um, is for the installation of 10 mini grids, uh, four off grid systems in 2021. So our, definitely our focus is on, on an integrated energy approach. We believe energy is the foundation and an enabling factor for significant growth in our, our economy. We know our, our former president, Dr. Jack Dio, and current vice president is a champion uh, um, of the LCDS strategy. You know, when we look at, at the reestablishment of the Hi Amelia Hydro Falls, imagine had the previous government not stopped the Amalia Falls project. Guyana today would be ahead of the energy solution we would have been having cheaper energy. It is almost criminal what the previous government has done. They have put our country back five years. Now we have to retool the integrated energy plan in order to move forward. We are, have made a commitment to move the gas to shore uh, from, from the oil wells to Guyana. That, with the integrated energy solution, will give us the installation of that 400 megawatts of power. And with that, the creation of new industries that we would not have been able to see happen without the cheaper energy. Going back quickly to some infrastructure numbers that I think you talked about, you know, I want to make sure that when, when investors com combine the, the uh, investment in energy solutions and infrastructure, we, I believe, I've invested close to 25.6 billion alone in roads and bridges. Those are key components of any nation development. The energy as you and the infrastructure, as you mentioned, are key components. So we believe in protecting and defending our environment. That's the vision of, of our former president and our current president. And with that is why you see the Amalia Falls Hydro Project. You see the implementation of, of the renewable energy sources. We're looking at expanding that in the hinterland areas, in, in mini grids. And we are not looking at just developing the known sectors and the known um, uh, population areas, but we are expanding that uh, grid across the country. So we can look in other regions where development can happen and expansion in areas that, in agro-processing, for example, in region one, it's known for cashews and many other uh, fresh crops. Imagine getting cheaper energy there and able to produce agro processing and you have the, the waterways to ship those goods out. That is why the, the budget 21, 2021 and the president integrated vision of, of tying infrastructure to energy to ensure that the industries or known industries are modernized. modernized. What is our known industries? Our agriculture, sugar, rice, our cash crops, our tourism industry. Those are known industries that will be modernized now, enabling us with the, as an oil producing country, we are now no longer have to, you know, incrementally grow. I use the term, we can jump the curve. Some in the, in the media that tells us we should leave the resources alone. They don't understand these resources allow Guyana to achieve the vision and the, the, the dream of all Guyanese that, have, that is alive today and those that are gone. You cannot leave the resources. We need to take the resources right now and invest it in the key components of our country. There's no such thing in Guyana as Dutch disease. We have a president that understands where that money has to go, how it has to be spent, what has to be developed, and ultimately, I go back to his vision, is the creation of wealth for every Guyanese. We're not here to make any other person rich. We are here to make Guyanese benefit from our resources. We are taking the oil out. We are investing the oil uh, money and the off and downstream 
uh, effects of that in our industries that will benefit our people. The fact is that we can, can expand our construction. Fact is that majority of Guyanese can now have the, the dream of building a home. You can ask for better than that, better paying jobs. I had a, the opportunity uh, today of, of signing an agreement with a back office processing technology group that so far has employed 200 people in our country. We in Guyana is running the law, one of the largest logistics transportation hub in the United States. Our people are directing the um, where the truck goes. We are people are directing where Amazon drops off the um, the goods and which which container has to go back on on the 18 wheeler. Those things are being done in Guyana. That's the creation of wealth and creation of jobs, higher paying jobs in our country. So as we build out technology, as we build out infrastructure, as we reduce the energy costs, the the integration of both local and private sector ability to to jump jump on that bandwagon is significant. Thanks, Peter, for that comprehensive uh, response. And I, I certainly like two particular things that, that you have raised there, um, and they will guide uh, the, this, the remainder of the discussion before we head to the first break, uh, which I'm sure Devin will soon be, be signaling to me. But you mentioned something uh, there regarding the, the talk in the media about um, the extraction of the oil resources. And I find it, Peter, like you, um, I find it to be a very strange conversation because those who understand or read into global development and global growth know that the world in 2050 or 20, 2040 even will be a very different place than it is in 2020 because we are all moving towards sustainable energy um, and we just spoke about that. And so when this talk in the media comes up about depletion policy, and leaving resources in the ground and all of that, the value of what we have today with all signals that are being sent will not be the same in the foreseeable mid uh, long term future. And so it is imperative that at this point, the extraction is done even more than anything else. So 2050, who knows what the oil and gas industry will look like It may be completely replaced uh, by what what is, what is being termed as sustainable energy forms. Um, and so you have rightly pointed that out and maybe we, we, we need to have that discourse even more or even further because I find it to be a very strange um, articulation and I don't understand why it's being done. Now, Peter, you pointed rightly and aptly to a sector that is of utmost importance in Guyana and that is the agriculture sector. Now, one thing which people have not really been following closely is the allocation to the agriculture sector in Guyana. And year after year, particularly over the past two full year budgets presented by, by former Minister of Finance, Winston Jordan, he boasted about the expansion of the budget, but what he did not what was not brought forth by many persons was the fact that the agriculture sector allocation actually declined year after year. So in one year, it moved from 19 billion down to 17 billion. Um, and I think it hovered somewhere around there in the last one. This budget, however, has expanded, but it has also expanded the allocation to the agriculture sector all the way up to about $22 billion, $23 billion, which in and of itself represents not only the government's willingness, but the government's tangible steps towards the development of the agriculture sector. Now, I heard a number of, of uh, policies and a number of investments being highlighted by Dr. Singh in his budget presentation recently. Um, and of course, those for those who understand elementary um, development uh, or, or even looking at natural resource management, you know that promotion of the agriculture sector is one of the ways in which you ward off this famous Dutch disease or the natural resources curse. And so that alone is a step in the right direction. But Peter, um, 
I want us to do to touch on two parts of agriculture, two things regarding agriculture before perhaps we go to the first break. Um, and I, I really am interested in your views on this. The first one will be the one that we can we can address in a in a less than comprehensive way. But which particular sectors of, of agriculture is the government looking uh, to promote? I know in the fourth budget there were some uh, considerations regarding soybean, etc. Um, but are there any uh, particular sectors or subsectors rather of agriculture that the government is really telling investors, hey, hone in on this? Richard, I, I, I got stuck that you interjected um, um, the former finance minister Winston Jordan's name. You know, I remember sitting on the airplane. Uh, next to the former president, uh, David Granger. And uh, we were talking about why the uh, economy was um, going downhill. And I said, it's because of your finance minister. He said, well, well I've got the best finance minister, right? And I went to describe the fact that Winston Jordan is maybe a good accountant. He is there to protect your money. He didn't know how to invest the money. If you need a, 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 a good investment, uh, an economist that understands how to tell you to buy the right stock and how to make money and grow money, you need to hire Dr. Barajan Bio. And I remember David Granger just turned his face and stopped talking to me. So the fact is, uh, Jordan didn't understand what Guyana was about. He was there to raise taxes uh, on people. He collected a lot of money, he spent it out on wasted resources. He didn't understand how to invest in agriculture. but. You know, as we move towards what is happening today, you know, in our current budget, $22.6 billion has been allocated to agriculture for food security. Food security is very important to Guyana. We have to then look at how do we potentially feed the Caribbean. Caribbean imports $5 to $8 billion worth of food every year from everywhere else around the world. Our investment in agriculture is significant. $832 million, I believe, in agriculture infrastructure and agro processing and packaging facilities in this 2021 budget. So as you as you look at, 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 at those areas, those sub areas in the agriculture and add the billions of dollars, $12 billion, I believe, in, in drainage, we are ready to ensure that the agriculture sector becomes that foundational uh, sector that becomes the core of our growth. Our growth is not about oil and gas. Our growth, probably the number one, in my opinion, is agriculture. And that's why we are investing significantly our money in agriculture. You know, when you think of irrigation and what, you know, and, and farm roads for small, medium, and mega farms, what that would do, we've got 83,000 square miles. This is the size of Great Britain. We have the ability to produce. You know, right now we import milk, we import soya bean and corn for a stock feed. We are moving to growing our own. We are moving to develop the input products for our livestock industry. That is revolutionary. And that's what budget is focused on. So it's not about wasting money like Jordan did and taking people's taxes. It's by investing it back where you and I and our farmers and our producers and our exporters can be able to be part of that development process. Government is a partner. Government is an investor. If you don't succeed, that means we have failed. Our goal is to ensure that every citizen benefit from the budget. And you are already seeing that. The fact that we have reversed all those high drainage fees and license fees uh, that, that the former accountant minister uh, you know, not an economist put on our, our country, uh, a former president that had no clue what was happening around him. We have put those things in place in order for farmers now to be excited. You can see the removing VAT on heavy machinery for farming. You're seeing farmers upgrading their equipment, investing in modernization, because they now see that they can develop their farmlands we are putting the transport economics in place. We're looking at our bilateral treaties, our CARICOM treaties. We want to help the goods to get to, to market. And 
ultimately, as we move forward, going back to infrastructure just, just for a second, when we move to the deep water harbor, transport economics become something of importance because now as you grow more, as you expand your agriculture and you can get your goods to market quicker, that's how we will succeed. That is what enabling factors such as oil and gas will do for a country. So as you said earlier, let's get on with it. Let's get our natural resource out. Let's use it to the benefit of our known industries, modernize them and move forward. Thanks for your response, Peter. Um, the other topic which I want us to focus on regarding agriculture, the, the, the other theme uh, on agriculture is the conversation on sugar. And I want us to just dive a little bit deeper into the conversation of sugar. Recently, um, in budget 2021, $2 billion has been allocated to, as, a, as a subvention to Gaisuku uh, for, for this year, which of course is just about 0.3, um, 0.4% uh, of the, the total national budget. But interestingly, in the parliamentary debates, um, and I was asked this question in a public space, and I'm interested to hear your opinion too on it. Um, the opposition MP Kemrad Ramjitan labeled the industry and its $2 billion as a, as a blood sucker on the Guyanese economy. Peter, what would you have to say um, to a comment of this nature? And what is what do you or how do you see the importance of sugar at this particular juncture for Guyana's economy and the development? Well, first, it's criminal that the MP, the Honorable Kemal Dranjatan, can even have an opinion on sugar when he and the former president personally shut down the sugar industry and fired 10,000 sugar workers. So it's it, it just, it, 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 it is uncomprehensible what that he would have said. The investment in sugar, and I want to explain, and, and, and I believe our, our CEO, says the right thing, and the board and our, 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 our great Minister of Agriculture is doing an ex excellent job in revitalizing and re-energizing the sugar industry. Folks got to understand that it's not the sugar that we eat or we put in our tea that is the product. It is the sugar cane that is the product. Imagine when Ramjatan closed the sugar industry with the old man Granger they not only shut down the sugar component, but DDL, for example, had to import molasses to make the rum. We had no byproducts of the sugar industry. Our packaging uh, plant was non-existent. Imagine this week, two of the estates surpass their goal of what they had to produce. We are packaging more. You know, the billion dollars of subvention is, is going to ensure that the diversification of our sugar industry is sustained. And Gaisuko is not just about managing the sugar cane. They're responsible for the drainage. They're responsible for the healthcare. They're responsible for many things of the, the workforce, which in many other private sector industries, government as a separate is responsible for that. So as you dissect the, the operating expense of Gaisuko, you can see that it will be are profitable as we rebuild the, the, the sector. And so you're right, two billion has been invested more in Gaisuko. It is producing, it has a long way to go when you look at some of those factories that they stole the equipment, they give away the equipment, they shut it down. Again, I use the term criminal. They should never be allowed to ever get in any closeness to management of Guyana economics ever again, and they will not. Because our people have realized that they had no care of them. You know, when you shut down or, or fire thousands of sugar workers, the rippling effect of thousands of people in those regions that have suffered, I mean, reviving an economy, and that's our budget, as you saw the word reviving, reviving our economy through investment in the key sectors of agriculture. You know, we, we mentioned the billions of dollars going in, not just to drainage, but into agro-processing facilities, into the sugar industry, into the drain system. 
How do we help small and medium and mega farms succeed? That is what is going to make the future of that industry succeed. So I'm, I'm satisfied that the budget 2021 have started the trajectory of growth in that area. Um, the opposition in the 2021 budget debate was so weak, they couldn't even come up with a line item to disagree or an alternative to present. It was the most shameless discussion that was publicly displayed in Guyana democracy that we have an opposition that cannot even read the budget of the estimates on how and what it will do to all the communities. And I tell their supporters, you listen to them, you are shutting yourself down. You cannot listen to what they are telling you. You need to get on with being part of Ghana development or it will leave you behind. Our president will ensure you're not left behind, but he needs you to join in to ensure that you participate. If you're a small farmer across any of the regions, you want to get into the mega farming, study our budget. Every investment opportunities in that budget allows you to be part of that development. Thanks for that, Peter. I, I think, um, Peter, uh, very interestingly, one, one of the problems, and, and you, you alluded to it uh, tacitly in your response, but one of the problems that we find in the public discourse here in Guyana, particularly on, on Gaisuko, is that the industry is being viewed from financial lens, just dollars and cents. But we're not talking here about a company. We're not talking here about just some uh, small type of, of structure that is perhaps a micro or a medium-sized enterprise. We're talking here about a large, a large economic animal that has to be viewed not only with the financial lens, but from the lens of the economy. It has to be viewed in terms of its contribution, as you rightly pointed out, to drainage and irrigation, its ability to earn foreign exchange, its ability to provide employment, its ability to keep the NIS going, its ability to spark economic growth within certain communities, its ability to produce a number of value-added uh, products and inputs into various manufacturing processes, and, it's, and further to that, even its potential. I can say this, that there are persons in the private sector that as a result of what happened to the sugar industry, says, of course, and esteem there, as you rightly pointed out, they're doing a fabulous job on turning things around. But there are problems, of course, that are lingering due to that stagnation that happened with the industry. And so you find that uh, you find that many persons, they don't they no longer have. Uh, sufficient input uh, or they did not have sufficient input into their manufacturing process. And so they had to turn to other markets. Now, I think understanding the role of sugar and seeing that we cannot view this with just only a unidimensional lens or a very simplistic financial term uh, structure, will it will not allow um, for the complete picture and certainly there are still issues and they need to be worked out. Um, but I don't think that in any way um, we should be looking to move towards that type of, of closure. Um, and I, I think it was a major, major error. Um, and the, the, the political economy aspect of that needs to perhaps be examined by those who would have made the decisions. I have a question here, Peter, um, in, in the comment box. And it, it particularly uh, Go Invest would be able to address something like this. The question is, if a company is interested in the production of perhaps a special type of organic sugar or something of the sort, but does not want to invest in Gaisuko, would the present government and Go Invest under your guidance allow this type of investment or support this type of investment? I, I don't see any reason why we will, you know, there's always uh, a partnership uh, component within, you know, the government agencies. I mean, our goal is the diversification of, of the sugar industry in, in, in looking at all of the value added products that uh, that can come out of that sugar cane. So if an investor has a proposal 
that um, can be looked at and, and uh, evaluated to see where the benefits uh, to Guyana will be and, and the benefits across the board. We absolutely would, would entertain an evaluation of such a proposal. Thanks very much for that, uh, Peter. Now, I want to pivot the conversation once again into, into another uh, area. We would have started off this evening um, with a mention of the role of the diaspora in Guyana's economic development. And Globespan, of course, has a, a, a wide viewership within the diaspora. And so perhaps you can, for us, Peter, tonight, highlight what are some of the, the uh, potential programs or the current programs which the Office for Investment is going to put in place uh, for, for the persons in the diaspora who either want to return home or who would like to invest. So I think that would be a great interest <coughs> to our viewers and listeners this evening. Well, the government as a whole, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, has embarked on uh, a diaspora engagement, a diaspora strategy that I believe will be revolutionary uh, for all of us that have been associated with the diaspora in the past. You know, we want the diaspora to return. Uh, we will give the incentives. You know, most people are simple things such as I want to bring my vehicle back. I want to bring my household goods back. Uh, you know, if I have a boat, I want to bring it back. Well, those are things that we're looking at facilitating uh, for the diaspora to come back to Guyana. But ultimately, I, I base it on, on why did the diaspora leave in the first place? Uh, many left back in the 80s to, due to dictatorship and, and the lack of economic uh, um, creation and jobs for our people. A lot of people went for better education. Uh, and given how the world has moved, you know, post during COVID-19 and after, and you look at Guyana growth trajectory, we're going from one FPSO uh, to six FPSOs by 2026, to 10 potentially by 2030. We are an oil producing country. We'll be in the top 20 in the world in oil producing country. The job environment and the creation of wealth in all of the industries I've talked about is real. This is not made up. You know, NASDAQ says we are the, one of the fastest growing co co uh, economy in the world and would continue to be the fastest growing economy. So a diaspora working hard in, in, in New York City, you know, in the coal in the winter, going on two subways to make that money that they're making. I personally believe, and I've seen it happening in front of my eyes, our job market is changing. We need engineers back. We need ICT people back. We need, you know, senior level managers back. The pay scale is starting to be comparable. And guess what? We are a beautiful country. We are the country people dream to come back to. We have the, the right environment. And what government has invested in, you know, they've invested, I believe, in, 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 in the last budget in education. Significant budget um, in, in improving our education system. We are embarking on healthcare, for example. How do we improve healthcare to make, to make our people, both in Guyana and those that want to come back, come to, to our country? When the diaspora look at, at Guyana, they want to make sure that we've got security and we've got healthcare and we have the job opportunities and we have the environment that enables them to flourish in, in areas that they, they are accustomed to. And that's where we are, we are putting back in place those, those con components that will attract the diaspora. So I'm excited to, to welcome back those folks. We are gonna embark on a, on, a, on, a, on a road show that will explain in more detail what the, the government has done and and how they can be part of that that process. There are many many components of the diaspora that I can talk about. I personally came back from the diaspora 15 years ago. I 
came back because I really love to be in Guyana. I love the atmosphere. I love our people. I love our environment. I know sometimes it's more difficult than, and than we may be accustomed to in North America or London or in Canada. But you know, we get a chance to finally working with President Ali, all of us get a chance to develop the Guyana we want to develop Guyana in how we always dream it should be. And you couldn't ask for a better reason to return to Guyana. Why don't you become part of it? What is it that we need to do with Guyana to ensure that you feel welcome back? You know, and that's what our president wants. That's why he's expanded the diaspora corridor. He wants to make sure we link our Guyanese across the world. We're one nation, one destiny, we're one people. No matter what your identity have become, we have not lost that flag. You know, those that are flying that flag in their house right now, around the world, on your car, it's that sense of pride, it's that sense of duty, it's that patriotism that you want again to feel and you can feel it in our country. So if I can if I can convince you and let us look at the opportunities from an investment perspective, it is significant. Why allow other people to come and take the wealth that you too deserve? Come in, look at our ICT, our technology, for example. When you look at telecommunication, we have liberalized telecommunication industry, data warehousing, back and front offices, call centers, software development companies. Those are areas Ghana is now getting into. The hospitality industry, we'll talk hopefully about tourism in a second. You know, the, the growing of our hospitality industry is significant. The job market, the oil and gas sector, we are expanding, looking for private universities to come to Guyana. We're looking at expanding in the medical tourism. The healthcare sector is going to be improved. It's time again, all of us get involved. So Richard, I, I, I get excited when I talk about the diaspora because I really believe it's time we connect back our people around the world under the leadership, bold leadership of Dr. Ali. This one Guyana, this one people is not about just who is in Guyana. It's about all of us that have exited our, shore, our shores and why is it we need to be part of this development. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, Peter. I think the diaspora has a very important role to play in Guyana's economic development, uh, and especially given that we have this newfound uh, oil and gas sector, this burgeoning oil and gas sector. Many of our of our uh, diaspora brothers and sisters actually do have skill sets that fit very well into the the, the skill sets being required for the core oil and gas ser services, but also um, the peripheral services and, and, and product uh, provision, which we see associated with the oil and gas sector. I want to say, you know, Peter, I have a lot of conversations with you. You asked the question about what what you think it, it, it would take um, to get some of these guys to return home. I think two things the diaspora persons see as being, the diaspora brothers and sisters see as being very, very important. And you perhaps know this. Um, also being being a member of the diaspora um, and then returning from the diaspora some years back, that they really want to see good governance and, and, and public security in the country. Um, they want to know that if if they be that they can walk the road without the fear of being mugged or they can sit comfortably in their houses without a break and enter, or if they call the police, they would be on their way shortly. Um, and they also want good good health care system available. They want to know that, you know, when the, in, in their old, older age, if they have any illness, that they can be adequately looked after. Um, and when they when they pick up the phone and they dial 912, uh, that the ambulance comes and they, they don't have to wait for a long time. One of the things which I want to ask you directly, though, Peter, do you see a role for the diaspora in perhaps the local content uh, policy? or local content legislation. I know that um, there have been discussions about uh, employment for Guyanese um, and then perhaps moving to the, the region or to the, the rest of the globe at large. But do you see that perhaps we should be writing into the, the local content policy a role for the diaspora? 
You know, there's a, the statement is you never lose your birthright. You know, as a Guyanese, you are a Guyanese. You could live anywhere in the world, but, you know, your birth certificate says born in Guyana. So I really believe we don't want to dis, dis differentiate Guyanese overseas or Guyanese uh, local. I think all of us coming together, you know, you get a chance to set up your company, you set, get a chance to be a participant in our development. Uh, Richard, you talk about healthcare, you know, in 2021 budget, $53.5 billion went into our, our healthcare, going to go into our healthcare system. $60 billion, I believe, goes into our education system. So, you know, as a diaspora look at a family-oriented return to our country, you know, you're looking for land to build a house. You know, if you move from Florida, from New York or Canada, Florida, you're looking for that nice lake. You're looking for that nice sunshine. Our president has proposed a second city, the Silica City, up closer to the Tiberi Arena, beautiful white sand, looking down a hill, into lakes, into the, the, the environment where you can have a boat and move to the Demerara River. For those who know South Florida, the intercoastal, or Demerara River is one of the nicest, smoothest river. It, it goes from the salt water down to, to Region 10, Linden, and beautiful black water uh, in big lakes. It's a beautiful country. and and. As Richard said, as we as we invest in, in, in education, as we invest in infrastructure, as we invest in our healthcare system, we invest in security, we are creating that enabling environment to link the diaspora back to Ghana. Local content become all of us. We are the local content. That's why the president has put an initiative to ensure local content is a key legislative program not just a policy program, but a legislative program that allows our people to have first cut at the opportunities, first cut at the contracts. Companies coming in can partner with us, but we get to lead it or we get to be part of it. We are not left out. You cannot ask for a better vision and, and implement it, implementation plan by Dr. Ali in ensuring, again, he used the term one Guyana. One Guyana means all of us. That work certificate that you have that says born in Guyana means you are part of one Guyana. And I can't stress our president's vision enough where he really wants to see that reconnection and whatever it will take, he is putting programs in place to ensure that we bridge that gap and we bridge that gap very quickly. And just like I would open the program that says, don't get left behind on Ghana development for our local counterparts right here, our citizens, my fellow citizens um, around Guyana. Diaspora, don't get left behind. You can develop another country, but imagine if you can help develop our country and you can benefit from the development of our country. That sense of commitment and pride and, and patriotism and the ability to see results is going to be a key component going forward. And you know, I brought my daughter back to Ghana uh, after she spent about 12 years in the U.S. and then she is going to school and, you know, she's getting to see a different environment. And, and, and you know, she was born here but then moves away. And I, I, I'm proud to see that, that she is taking that mantle and understanding that the, the future of, of her development depends on her uh, taking the mantle and, and going with it. And going back to the start of your program, um, Richard, you know, the vision of our country is under great um, leadership, a young, educated, aggressive president that understands he grew up in a different environment. He grew up in a country that, that he wants to see develop. And we have concentrated a lot on 2021 budget, but is is rightfully, if you haven't read it, and you just study what Dr. Ashley Singh has outlined in the preamble of the budget, you will really understand that Guyana is not what you know. If you're studying the last five years, that's not Guyana. The Guyana is, the future is what you see and what our numbers describe tonight. Eight or $20 million in youth entrepreneurship. You know, when you, do, when you invest in young people, and that's our president, he has put eight or $20 million in investing in young people to grow you know, in innovation youth programs in our country. 
if we educate our people, we can develop our country and don't let anybody come in and take it away from us. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Peter. And and you're you're right to continue to uh, allude to Dr. Ali um, and his vision for Guyana. Uh, he is somebody. He's a he is a leader who has who is very much active, very much on the ground. People can see him uh, and 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 feel his presence um, because he is he's almost always there and engaging with the citizenry. Um, so I I very much like that that you that you stress um, on his vision. That's very important and it does set the tone. Um, of course, he's not governing from some back room um, and, and, and people are not seeing him and he's engaging with the with public. So that, of course, is very commendable and people people in the country and even broadly are are, are noticing it. Uh, Peter, you mentioned a very, a very interesting point there and I'm not too sure how many people know of it. Um, and perhaps when we return from the break, you can shed some more light on it, is the new city which the government has in store uh, for the, the public. And, and we'll chat a little bit also about tourism uh, in Guyana, business tourism, opportunities for development, um, and a few other topics in the time that we have remaining. So folks, thank you for being here with us for this first segment. Um, I have here with me Dr. Peter Ramsaru, and we have been talking about Guyana, Guyana's economic development, investment and growth of the country. I think we can take a very short break now uh, and we'll be back soon. You can now have all your groceries delivered to your home. Allfromonesupplier.com has all your grocery needs, plus all of your West Indian items. Purchase all your groceries and all your West Indian items from one place and get free delivery to your homes and free shipping. Allfromonesupplier.com has free deliveries locally in New York and free shipping to all U.S. states. Our shoppers choose the best items, package nicely, and deliver to your home. We have all your grocery needs and all your West Indian items, a one-stop shop. So place all your orders on allfromonesupplier.com or call 718-551-3292. That's online at allfromonesupplier.com or call 718-551-3292. Get all your groceries and all your West Indian items from allfromonesupplier.com with free delivery deliveries and free shipping to all U.S. states. Travelspan offers all airlines such as American, Caribbean, and JetBlue. So let Travelspan compare all airlines and offer you the best fare. Call Travelspan at 718-845-0437 for the lowest deals between New York, Miami, and Guyana. That's Travelspan at 718-845-0437. Call Travelspan in New York at 718-845-0437, Georgetown at 227-1701, or Berbice at 337-4287. In New York, 718-845-0437, Georgetown 227-1701, or Berbice 337-4287, and West Coast Demerara at 269-1701. 0140. Let Travelspan book you the best deals for you and your families. Travelspan now has travel and shipping services. Shop online and deliver to Travelspan to handle all of your shipping to Guyana and Trinidad. Travelspan brings 26 years of experience in the travel business. Travelspan will clear your items and have it available at any of our offices in Guyana or Trinidad. So go online and purchase your item. Then let Travelspan handle all the shipping. Shop and ship made easy with Travelspan. With offices in New York, Georgetown, Berbice, West Coast Demerara, and Trinidad. Travelspan, serving you with your airlines and shipping needs. Call in New York 718-845-0437. And in Guyana, call 227-1701. That's in New York, 718-845-0437. And in Guyana, 227-1701. And in Trinidad, call 672-2060. That's 672-2060. Ladies and gentlemen, viewers and listeners, welcome back to our program. Uh, 
If you're now joining us, I have with me here Dr. Peter Ramsarup, Chief Investment Officer of Guyana and the CEO for the Guyana Office for Investment. Peter and I this evening are chatting a bit about Guyana's development, investment, and overall economic growth in Guyana. A number of areas we have already covered, um, of course, not, not, not limited to, but including agriculture, the energy sector, budget 2021, uh, the president's uh, vision for Guyana's growth, diaspora, and so we have had a lengthy conversation going on for quite some time now, just um, almost about an hour and 15 minutes. But we ended the last segment of this program with Peter giving us some insight into the fact that the government of Guyana is embarking on building a new city, and he calls it Silica City. Now, I'm not sure how many persons in the public know about Silica City, and Peter, you will be well positioned to perhaps shed some light uh, on, on Silica City, uh, what the president's vision is, perhaps how soon we can see this coming on the way, and what does this mean within what we would have been discussing earlier regarding construction and the opportunities for Guyana? <clears throat> well, the vision of our president, I mean, and, and if you listen to how he has described that vision, uh, as you know, he was uh, served as the Minister of Housing, Minister of Tourism and Trade um, in the early 2011 to 2015. Very, very ambitious and very energetic minister that was extremely successful in developing our housing industry, developing uh, our better water systems, uh, moving our uh, trade and tourism into uh, an area where, you know, by by the time we left office and and the the word got out, Guyana became the number one uh, destination in tourism. But our president has always have, had a vision of, of Guyana needing a second large city, uh, something new, something exciting, something that um, we can design from scratch. And uh, the area he has picked is, is on the, the, the Tiberi side of, of um, Guyana between the ending of Region 4 and the early parts of Region 10. As I mentioned earlier, you've got tributaries coming in from the Demerara River. You've got hills and, and you have vegetation, uh, you know, forestry all in there that as you design and you build a master plan, and he's not just building a master plan for that city, he's actually looking at our, our, our current cities around Guyana and redeveloping zoning systems, modernizing, modernizing uh, certain components. We are expanding, for example, uh, for those who know Georgetown, there will be a bypass road coming down from Tamari, bypass from, from Eccles to to Ogle, there's going to be a new four-lane highway that connects to the Tamari Airport, and in 20 minutes you could be in Georgetown. So when you think of a city in that area, and you can drive a, a four-lane highway, no difference than any other developed country in the world, and get to Georgetown in 20 minutes, you're going to find a lot of people potentially migrating to that, and and new corporations, new businesses coming in that that requires corporate headquarters being close to the airport. Yesterday, I signed uh, an agreement and, and witnessed an agreement between the Marriott and the developer to build the Marriott courtyard in the airport compound. That construction will start probably within the next month. That is fascinating, you know, to to be able to those again that travel the world that we're going to have a, a, a Marriott in the hotel compound. Uh, that when you're traveling, you can transit, you can exit. So the, the Silica City, the, the second city, is already going to be started by that expansion of the airport, the development of the four-lane uh, road to, to, to Mary, and then ultimately the connection between the road to Brazil and the Deepwater Harbor. So Guyana is on the move. These are real projects, real happening right in front of our eyes. You, you already see some of the, the development in the, the construction industry and and I think that's where going back to slightly to the diaspora 
that doesn't want to come and live in 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 uh, Georgetown, for example, or or anywhere else, they now get a chance to maybe develop it the way they want to develop, like they're doing the developer. So the president is very open to, to ideas. He's looking for large developers to uh, join in on that plan, and it's going to be exciting over the next few years to see a second city brew in Guyana and what can come about uh, and the the implications and the the the, the benefits of such a city. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I love the water. It would be nice to be able to live on a lake and to be able to have a boat that goes down the Demerara River. You know, I can actually come to work in Georgetown with a boat. So I find a lot of people very excited. I think the president has, has created that excitement that, that there are alternatives in the future for us to look at and the second city is real and it will happen. Yeah. Peter, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And you know, um, that it, you use the right word there in your closing, in your closing sentence is that it's a very, very exciting uh, prospect. Because when you think about it, you, you're not only getting a chance to be, to live in something, um, uh, live in a brand new city, but you're also being given the opportunity to help develop and shape that city and shape that environment. Um, the way that perhaps you you envision Guyana. This, I think, is where we need all hands on deck to be able to uh, help to develop Guyana. And certainly, uh, we're right, uh, Peter, by identifying that alternatives are being provided by Dr. Ali. I mean, we see the rapid pace at which the bypass road has happened from Diamond uh, to to. Uh, the the Eccles area and and that in itself providing an alternative provides very good uh, transportation structure in place to cater for the expansion and the and the further growth of Guyana and the Guyanese economy. Peter, you mentioned a very interesting thing there too, where you talk about uh, the projected Marriott courtyard Marriott in the airport uh, compound. And of course, the, the, the Cherry Jagan International Airport expansion project, um, which was started many years ago um, with the vision that we would become this tourism hub and the oil and gas sector and the, the, the business tourism, which has been happening, has really driven um, tourism, tourism upward. An interesting point, Peter, is that since the discovery of oil and gas, Guyana has, at least to, to the best of my reading of the records and the history uh, and the data which we have, Guyana has actually become a net, it has actually become positive in its net arrival rate of visitors. It's the first time in the country's recent history and that I have seen the data for that we have more persons arriving in the country than persons leaving the country. And this in itself spell uh, a great deal of potential for the country. Now, tourism, as we know, is one of those frontier sectors. It's one of those sectors that recently, um, and recently I mean within the long trajectory of Guyanese history recently, um, past 20 years or so, we have been seeing a push or an advancement towards tourism. Uh, what types of investments do you see happening here in, in the tourism sector, Peter? And then secondly, what types of investments are the, uh, the government, is the government looking to promote within the tourism sector? Well, we have a, a dynamic Minister of Tourism, Minister Waldron, that in our budget presentation uh, to Parliament outline what um, are her initiatives in that sector. And as you know, we collectively, um, led by her ministry, put out uh, an expression of interest that Guyana needs approximately 2,000 rooms over the next five years in order to, to manage the influx of um, visitors, investors, returnees coming back to our shores. Um, before I get to what I'm going to answer there, the Marriott Hotel, for example, in Guyana, the current hotel, is the best occupancy rate hotel during COVID-19 in the world. 
it has an occupancy rate at any given time, only 13 rooms may be available in any given week out of the 200 rooms or so that the hotel has. So it tells you even within COVID-19, the, the, the influx of visitors and uh, investors coming into our country is still significant. So as we outline what um, the need is going forward, a post-COVID-19 environment, and as you know, in 2020, Guyana was voted the number one ecotourism destination in the world. We didn't get a chance to execute it because of COVID-19, but COVID-19 actually allows us now, as people don't want to go to Las Vegas anymore and be congested in crowds, they're looking for, for new areas as ecotourism in an open space. Our, our dynamic minister just outlined how she plans to ex execute the ecotourism uh, sector. You know, she has invested in this budget $185 million to develop and construct a hospitality institute. So we're not just going to look at the expansion and, and we didn't just get 2,000 rooms proposals. We got rooms for 5,000 uh, or, or uh, proposal for 5,000 rooms, but you know, it will be limited to about about 2,000 rooms over the next five years. We just signed a, a start breaking and, and a bit with the president, I was, I'm with the minister, part, part of a groundbreaking ceremony for Midtown Georgetown for a development of a Best Western Hotel, 100 plus rooms. The Marriott Courtyard is 200 plus rooms. We have a, a proposal on the table that is being finalized for a 500 room hotel. We've got many, many of these sectors coming in. So the minister realized that this is an industry that is growing. So by instituting a budget, budgetary allocation that will commence the construction of a hospitality training institute, we expect that to be a key component of, of us to support that industry. And you know, for those around the world that may be working in hotels in the Caribbean or other parts of, of, of the developed world, you have a chance now to come back and be part of the teaching staff, be part of getting trained to work in that industry. So the tourism is another key founding pillar of President Ali's vision. We talk about agriculture, we talk about infrastructure, we talk about energy. We have other natural resources such as forestry and mining and tourism is the next big component that we find investors coming in apart from, you know, each one of these hotels costs anywhere from 15 to 50 million US dollars uh, to develop. That's all input um, foreign currency coming into our country, um, jobs for people. The construction industry is booming. We are seeing the, the influx of, of the production side, concrete plant uh, suppliers. We have concrete factories being developed around the country as the housing market booms. The, the input industry, people are looking to do precast concrete in Guyana. I want to just jump quickly to, to a sector that I don't want to lose time on, and the forestry. We now export prefab houses out of Guyana for many parts of the Caribbean. We're not just sending our, our wood across the world. Our folks have gone developing. I, I just visited a, an export uh, facility this weekend that all those gazebos, many of those gazebos that you see in Home Depot in, in the United States, a lot of those are being made in Guyana. We are doing the deck chairs. We are exporting. We are exporting sand, beautiful white sand for beaches, millions of dollars in export of sand for beaches around the world. We are exporting all the sand for many, many new golf courses. We want to see the next phase of industry. And the next phase is in the manufacturing sector as we bring the energy costs down. Yeah, cer certainly, Peter. Um, one, of, one of the things I think that needs to complement, needs to be in place um, to complement the tourism uh, that is happening here is, of course, uh, the development of the entertainment sector and to ensure, as you rightly said, for example, golf courses here in Guyana, um, you know, ensuring that you have the full golf course, ensuring that there's entertainment for families and, and families as they gain more and more disposable income. Um, and, and I think that with Dr. Ali's vision 
um, and his understanding of family um, and his understanding of households that that will become a reality in the near future. But Peter, I want to begin to wrap up tonight's um, segment, uh, tonight's program. And I want to ask, uh, we of course have the future of Guyana to consider. And persons looking on will think, you know, where should I or where could I be looking for job opportunities? Where could I be looking for investments? Where could I be looking to see Guyana go so that I can be able to position myself, uh, educate my children and so forth um, to be able to capture as much as possible. What are some of those frontier sectors, Peter? Um, and then after that, any last word which you may want to slip in for tonight's program? Well, I just finished with the hospitality sector. Um, we see significant jobs in our market, the, the Hospitality Institute. We have going to expand uh, oil and gas uh, institute also in Guyana, where folks can, uh, you know, be well trained in that frontier industry uh, that will continue over the next decade plus. And and so, from an educated standpoint, those are where some of the the focus will be. And future jobs are the downstream industries. We really believe that as the energy costs come down, the agro uh, sector, the agriculture, the agro processing, the manufacturing uh, component will be significant. So investors understanding the, the puck, where that puck is going to be. If you bring energy costs down 60%, you're able to compete in the manufacturing sector. What do I want to do? Do I really want to ship that Gulf Coast sand out? Or do I want to look at manufacturing glass? in Guyana? Do I want to look at, at, at turning our raw materials, you know, those that understand the green beans in a can? What, what about our borer in a can? What about our pineapple cut in, 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 in a production facility for export? So instead of selling a pineapple for a dollar or two in the export market, we will be selling a can of, of pineapple for a dollar or two. We have significant uh, agricultural production. If we move to, to you know, drying our fruits, you know, if you travel in the airport in New York, you buy a little bag of dried bananas or dried um, uh, pineapples, it's three, four dollars. We are moving and that's the investment. This is, I, I, you have to study the budget. You have to see where our president is investing in. You look at those opportunities that will come and you start building those opportunities now. It's a beautiful um, uh, trajectory to be part of. And as I wrap up, Richard, I really enjoyed having the, the conversation with you. I think your input and your knowledge of our, our known environment. I, I, I ask many of you out there that, um, that are coming in again or are part again. Richard is part of the, the Chamber of Commerce. He is, he is involved in many companies and he's able to uh, facilitate and help uh, many of us understand these environments and, and, and what local capacity we have, what are our gaps and how do we need to build those gaps. So the diaspora is a good, good point of contact to come into also. But in wrapping up, uh, Richard, I just want to go back to the start of, of the program. Our president's vision for Guyana is a courageous and a bold vision in his leadership. He has outlined his economic agenda. He has developed the pillars and the trajectory of where he wants to get us to. He has put in place a budget that tells you it's an action-oriented budget, it's a result-oriented budget, it's a measurable budget that as we implement these components of it, you will be able to see the benefits of it, or people can see the benefit. Our foreign investors, we welcome you to the shores of Guyana. We have a very uh, lucrative uh, investment uh, climate here, our investment uh, plan, you can repatriate your profits, You double taxation issues are resolved in, in many areas. We have great uh, treaties around the world between the UK, the European Union, CARICOM, uh, the United States and other parts of the world where you produce your goods, the export capacity is there. We have great local um, uh, entrepreneurs in our country. And the, the president has put together that macro and microeconomic plan 
positioning it by uh, physical allocation, put in with, a, with a, a fabulous and a, the most competent team of cabinet ministers that you would have ever find around the world. And they are working extremely hard to implement this budget. We are on an exciting trajectory. We have a new uh, sense of pride and duty and commitment to our country. We feel the excitement. We're part of that excitement. Our people are coming together. The opposition is trying to stifle that economic growth once again. We are asking their supporters not to listen, not to be left behind, to be part of this growth, joining with us in our president's vision of a one Guyana. We're part of it and our office from the Guyana Office of Investment is here to help in any way possible. As you look at the, the bigger investments and you look at, at how you want to uh, be part of the growth, especially our local entrepreneurs, we, we are proud. And one of the things we were proud of, the president and I, when we turned that sod for one of the first major hotels in our new plan of the hospitality industry, was a local uh, company that stepped up to the plate and says, we can do it. We don't need anyone else to come in for us to do it. We are here, we're ready to do it. So the diaspora around the world, I wanna just appeal to you one more time, shake hands, join hands, look at where you can help, give us your input, but not just your input, be part of the development. That's what we're looking for. Bring your knowledge back to Guyana and help us and move us along and, and, and realize that our people, here that is, is in our country, has stayed behind, they have, they have developed themselves, they're part of our development. It's an exciting time for all of us to move Guyana forward under the bold, courageous leadership of my president, Dr. Irfan Ali. Thank you, Peter, for your contributions this evening. You certainly have been uh, very enlightening and you have raised a number of very important points. Those who have been paying keen attention uh, would, would certainly have a uh, number of points to take away and to utilize uh, to their advantage. So, you know, I, I saw, you know, we always have some very interesting comments going here on uh, in the chat box, and I saw somebody attempting to say, you know, it seems as if Peter wants to sell dreams, but, I want to say that, you know, that is really how we need to begin to think. We have to begin to dream and dream about this new Guyana and begin to act decisively um, and be very action oriented into getting uh, this new Guyana on the way. So but Peter, Richard, this I is not, uh, I, I interject, this is not dream. Guyana is one of the top producing of oil in the world. We will be in, in we are in the top uh, countries. It's no longer a dream. For those persons saying that they're, they're, they have not paid attention to where Guyana is today. Precisely, precisely. And, and, and those persons really, you know, maybe they need to begin to, to feel some of the energy which is here in Guyana and be part of, of, of it um, and align themselves to ensure uh, that they can capture the opportunities. But I want to say a couple of things before I close, Peter, that you've raised a very uh, a, a number of very important points. Um, the budget, of course, for me, I think it represents a step in the right direction as we would have uh, outlined regarding the construction industry and the potential that it has to spur economic growth. And so um, I urge all, even if you don't want to read the entire document, there is a component of at the end of the budget that, that speaks the measures um, in the budget speech. You can go through that and see some of the measures which have been put in place to see some of the changes. Um, additionally, there are some summaries available of the national budget. Um, BDO, for example, has a summary that is a, a, a one of the accounting firms here in Guyana. PricewaterhouseCooper, PwC, has also a very good summary. Um, so for those of you who are interested, you can perhaps put BDO, Budget 2021, uh, PwC, Budget 2021 into Google um, and find those synopsis uh, documents of the budget. Peter also alluded to a number of very important uh, treaties and a number of very important pieces of legislation uh, for investors. For those who are interested, can of course they can check out the Guyana Investment Act of 2004, if I'm not mistaken, um, and that Investment Act actually spells out. 
a number of uh, incentives for persons who are looking to invest in Guyana, and it gives the legislative framework under which uh, investment occurs. The Ministry of Finan uh, Foreign Affairs website, that has a number of our double taxation treaties and investment agreements, which we have with different countries. So I know we have some viewers who are not only based in the United States, they are viewing from other countries, perhaps in Europe, etc. Um, and you, of course, can have a look at those. So uh, I think I have one announcement to make here this evening from the, the, the technical team. They've indicated that from next week, Globespan will be starting programs from 7 p.m. This is both Eastern Standard Time, EST, as well as the Guyana Time. and uh, they certainly look forward to you being able to join at that time. So viewers and listeners all, it has certainly been a pleasure uh, for me to host this session this evening and chat with Dr. Peter Ramsaru, Guyana's Chief Investment Officer and the CEO of the Guyana Office for Investment on economic development, growth, investment, uh, and generally nation building in Guyana. Peter, I want to thank you so much for your contributions. You certainly have given great insight, um, and I look forward to working with you, continue working with you in the future, uh, and look forward to building a Guyana that is better for us all. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you to Globespan, and good evening, viewers and listeners.